device that it slows us down. There are things that are urgent, for sure. My wife calls and picking it up. Um, that sort of thing. But um, not everything needs to be answered immediately. Um, and tying into that, something Dr. Bradley said a long time ago, it may have been in one of his books, it may have been in class, but um, he encouraged us to handle mail one time, if at all possible. Instead of, you know, the mail's come in, and I've looked, all, looked at all of it, and I sit it over in this stack, and then now I'm moving the stack over here, and I'm looking at it again. When at all, all possible, handle it once. If you can toss it in the trash, toss it in the trash. The things that need to be responded to, if you can respond to them right then, great. Um, that, would be the, that would be the goal. It's not always possible, but I, I think it's, uh, that's been helpful for me to kind of move, uh, move quickly on some of those things. Placing limits on tasks. Sometimes setting alarms, if you can handle that, if you can handle the pressure, <laughs> and that's, this is me, type A me. If I can handle the pressure of setting 15 minutes, I'm gonna do this particular task, and you just, like you might be planning your worship uh, or your Wednesday night uh, rehearsal, you know you've gotta to get to these five anthems, and you're prior prioritizing 10 minutes to this one and five minutes to this. This one's ready to go, so it should be a run through. <laughs> you know, uh, this one needs 15 minutes because everybody's missing every entrance everywhere. You know, those kinds of things. Uh, if, you can, if you can set an alarm on your phone or, or you know, set a time limit for a task, um, sometimes it, ke it keeps me from wasting time in tur turning a five minute task into a 30 minute task. Um, just because I end up getting pulled into a lot of pastoral uh, type stuff because my office uh, is connected to the pastor's office and he's typically out and so it all overflows into my office most of the time. Um, just a couple more. Um, folks in our office are generally pretty chatty because we've worked together for a long time now. Um, I intentionally go through the office first thing in the morning and try to quickly chat with everyone. I try to create intentional time to have that chat time, and then I try to put my head down. I don't shut my door. You know, if someone comes in and, and, and something you know needs to talk, that sort of thing. But um, I've I've noticed that it's really really easy for me to get into a 45 minute conversation with our children's minister, who's also a choir director. And we're talking about all this stuff that that nobody else cares about, and realize that we both just sat there talking about something that you know maybe we could have talked about over lunch instead of. <coughs> you know, from 9 to 9.45. Um, even though those, those relationships are great, you want to cultivate those staff relationships when you can. Um, lastly, I'm just going to say um, technology. I spend a lot of time with technology. I, I, sometimes I feel like I spend more time with technology than I do with people these days, and I don't like that at all. But um, whether you're tech savvy or not tech savvy, if there's, a, if there's, if there's something tech that you've got to work with, I encourage you, because this does save time, to take the time to learn it before you need it. Because if you just if you just um, hang on for dear life when you need it, you're constantly going to be behind the eight ball when you're having to you know expand the usage of, of that technology. And I just encourage you to, to, to find the time, even if it has to be one evening. Uh, when you're, you know, binge watching Netflix or something, you know, start working with some of those things, and in order to get ahead. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, um, those are those are just a few things that just really off the top of my head. That's great. <laughs> you want to respond to Stephen? Have any questions for him? We approve. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Karen, tell us some stuff. Okay. How many of you are choral directors? Raise your hand. Okay. So, um, what I want to offer you is, uh, with your choir, is to be sure that you're prepared. Mm. One thing that I do that completely extends my, my numbers, my, my people being happy, is that I consistently will rehearse seven anthems out. That is seven weeks. Now that takes some preparedness and it also takes you bringing in some general anthems. But I find that my choir is much more confident as some of them are not readers. Uh, they sing by ear. Yes. Well, how long is your rehearsal time? An hour and a half. Hour and a half. Um, and then also 
I do, I have a men's section, tenor and bass section that is not very confident. And so I do rehearse with them outside of rehearsal for an hour a week, we do sectionals. And I've done that now for six months. And I am amazed at the confidence that it has instilled in them. So I wanna encourage, encourage you to plan that also if you can into your time management. So what it means is that you're gonna to have to, maybe if you're lucky, you can get your pastor to work with you seven weeks out. Um, that's a difficult task. Most of the pastors that I've worked for cannot do that. Uh, the one I currently have does, and um, we've already planned through the end of Advent. But what we have in our office is a whiteboard much like this one. And I will list the Sundays and then draw a line after each Sunday. So this section of the board is all devoted to one Sunday. The children's minister may have input on that board. Uh, the music minister might. The, the scripture needs to be up there. Any type of special Sunday like World Communion. or So you've got it and you're looking at it seven weeks out. And you can say, okay, I've got this much time now. Kind of like what he was saying about his things that you've got more time to plan and not feel so rushed and so stressed. Um, and then the next thing is, do not plan Christmas after October the 1st. Don't do it. And don't plan your Lenten season after February the 1st. It's just going to send so much stress. Um, and yeah. the, the thing about it is that when it, what permeates in us is what's going to bleed over into our volunteers. So ultimately, what in my opinion, what I'm responsible for is ensuring that they feel completely confident in their task and what they're doing. And then here's another step to this. If I can do that and instill confidence and use my time to nurture them, what I can do is empower them to take a part of my ministry and take the lead. See, so that's what our job is. Our job is to empower those in our ministry to feel like they can step up and take something. So let's say it maybe is a person who, I need some help leading the music one Sunday. So I'm gonna ask and I'm gonna work with a person and empower a person to do that. And what I have seen happen in that is just that my ministry has blossomed so much. And God has just jumped in there and worked through so many other people, which in, in turn, it makes my time management so much easier to, to control when we've got volunteers that are willing to help us. So that's what I have to offer you today. Tell, tell us where you are and what you do. I'm the uh, director of worship and uh, music at the Methodist Church in Weatherford, Texas. I currently have a choir of about 45. We, um, during special seasons, run about 60. So, yeah. When I started there, they had 13. Um, and so I, I honestly believe that I've, I'm learning these things, this empowerment tool, um, right now in my ministry because I've always sat in a place with my time management where I got to do, 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 mm -hmm. And I would just feel so exhausted all the time. And the, the second or the minute that I just said, okay, you know what, God, I'm going to do this. And I relinquished the stronghold that I had on that time management and me feeling like I had to accomplish it on my own. That is when this whole thing went to another level completely. And the beauty of it is being able to watch God work and grow other people. Because we, as the, the, music, the music directors, have really just relinquished a little bit of control. It's okay. It's okay. God will bless that beyond measure. Any other questions right now? All right, Eric. My name is Eric Stone, and I am the worship pastor at Country Acres Baptist Church in Wichita, Kansas. I have been there for 25 years. Wow. Um, I'll celebrate, well, I'll, in two weeks I'll be there 25 years, so I'm going to say 25. I'm, I'm hoping I'll make it two weeks, but um, <laughs> you got it. Uh, I've been there 25 years. Um, when I first started the church, I was part-time. I was uh, bivocational. I did music, youth, and another job uh, outside to, to do it. And then the church had grown enough 
in the year that I came, that I was able to become on full time as a music youth. And then two or three years later, the church dropped the youth, and I just did music. And so, um, kind of same thing. I started with eight people in my first choir rehearsal, and we sing with about 65 on a Sunday. And, and we have I have an orchestra um, with about 30 30 players. Um, God has just been so good in the in the time to do this. All these things that happened have been because of Him. It's nothing because of me. I always want to make that clear because. Um, but he's been very good to bless us with so much. And, and since that time, we started the Handel Choir and some other things. So we, we were slowly growing. The church had nothing when it came. So, um, and I had the wonderful fortune, a fortunate uh, um, thing of serving with a pastor who was there at the same time that I came. He came in June of 94, and I came in August of 94. And we both have been there the same amount of time. Mm. And one of the things that helps very been very helpful, as you mentioned, is he plans. I have the, the worship schedule or the, um, the sermon series from now until December. I mean, from now yeah. December, so I'm able to uh, be able to look at my schedule, plan a little bit more uh, effectively, and, and be able to look out. And I'm able to plan my services for what I need a little farther out, and that allows me to uh, have more time for critiquing and adding and subtracting and people putting input into those services because of the, the outward preparation or the, the planning out. I wrote just down a few things. Some will, will mirror some of the things that have been already said. But for me, the first thing is pray. As you, one of the things that you do first thing of the day. Um, God knows what you need to accomplish that day. He knows what you need, and he'll, he'll provide you the time to do it. So I, I always try to pray. Um, the second thing for me, and I know this, is, this was not one of my favorite things, but... Um, when I first started at the church, our office hours were 9 to 5, and so that's when I would come in. And so, so was everybody else coming at that time as well. So it was kind of the thing of, hey, I saw you Sunday, and what happened to your weekend? And, and, and so we'd get talking, and, and then someone would come in and interrupt you. I mean, there'd just be total times of where you'd get something going, and you'd stop, and you'd have to talk to people, which is fine, and those things need to happen. But for me, one of the things that really helped me be efficient with my time was my wife taught at an early start school. And so she had to be at work at 6.50. So we all, as a family, which is a killer, but we'd all get up at 6, and then we'd all leave the house together at 7. I could be at the office at 7.15. Mm. And I found that being there an hour and a half, an hour and a half, two hours early, allowed me to get a huge jump on the things that were going that day. Um, because no one was there. I mean, the pastor usually came in an hour later. The secretary's going to come in for an hour and a half later. And so I had almost two hours of uninterrupted time that I could just sit in my office. It was quiet. There was nobody around. And I could really get a, a jump on the task that I had for that day. Um, one of the things that I had on my list was prioritize your work, kind of what Stephen said. The, um, you know, I kind of, I know that I have a choir rehearsal on Wednesday. So Monday, I'll make a, a note to say that to prepare for these anthems on Tuesday so that when Wednesday comes, I, I've got, I made the time to do that. So I try to give myself a day in advance so I can start accomplishing the different things that I want to for that week. Um, so as you said again, and I don't mean to double everybody up, but it, you know, make a list. It, I think a list are important. I mean, it's so important. Um, I use Evernote, I use um, my phone, I use my iPad, I use my computer for um, reminders of things that I do during the day that I need to be reminded about. And I, and I love the list because it helps me to stay focused. Um, because all of us know that if you're in a church office, your time is not really your own. I mean, even, even though you maybe have something you're working on seriously, mm -hmm. someone may stop by and say, hey, I need to talk to you about this. Or the pastor may pop in and say, hey, I need to ask you about this. Or you get a phone call and so and so is in the hospital and you've got to go visit that person. And so, um, you know, making the list is, is helpful so that will help you stay on, on, on task. And I love what you said, but I'm going to take you Cooper at that too, is delegate. Um, one of the things that I've learned that I don't have to do everything. Uh, when I first started, I, you know, I, I did the choir books, I, I filed the music, I, I helped with the library, I did. Um, getting the choir books ready for Wednesday night. I pulled the pieces for the pianist because um, uh, we didn't have very much help then. And, and our church has grown, and so we have a secretary that does that now. But even now, I've delegated some of the things 
that um, that I used to do to them, which allows me more time to be free to minister. Absolutely. Um, it's so important to do that, and and I'm one of those kind of people that likes to do it myself because if I do it, on it will be done right. But the thing is, you've got to entrust it to someone else to let them, as you said, grow and, and, and to allow them the opportunity to minister and to be exactly. a part of the kingdom work by giving them that task. And yes, you can come alongside and help them, but delegation has really been important for me. Mm -hmm. um, limited interruptions. You know, I try to, I have a sign on my door that says either pastors and study or um, you know, do not disturb, or if, and, and if I turn it over, it says, welcome, please come on in. And I try to be very uh, proactive in using that because there are times when I do worship planning that I, I have to really think about it, and I really want to concentrate on what I'm doing, and the interruptions take me away from that. So when I put that sign on my door, the staff has been very good about, okay, I'll, I'll send an email, or I'll catch him later, and and so I just limit, in, in, excuse me, limit interruptions. Um, and then also I put, you know, I talk about prioritizing, but also reprioritize. You know, as the day comes, you know, you, you may have, I have my list sometimes, I'll look at the list and I'll say, well, I didn't get this done. So I have to reprioritize the things that I want to do to get accomplished. And that may mean that I move some of those things off that list to the next day and put those at the very first so that I can accomplish those things. But um, I have to be able to reprioritize and be flexible in that. So um, that's kind of what I have. Anybody have a question for Eric? Okay, then I'm Cheryl. And I am music minister at North Haven Church in Norman, Oklahoma. And I've been there almost seven years. I am a retired choir teacher. I taught um, middle school and high school choir for my main career. I always did some, some form of music ministry throughout those years as well. Sometimes it was being a music minister. Sometimes it was being a, a pianist or an organist. I don't even know how an organist, but you know how that goes. Um, so when, um, when Dr. Bradley asked if I would participate in this discussion, I thought, I'm not sure I really have this together. But what it did make me do is sit down and think about it mm -hmm. and start looking um, at how my days play out. My other hat that I wear now that I retired from teaching to go do is work real estate. You don't have any time management in real estate because you're on call all the time. Um, so. Sometimes my life really gets kind of crazy. Um, but back to the music ministry. So I looked at what I was doing and I found that I had some patterns that developed and um, through my day. So this, I'm gonna take you through my week, sort of. So on Sunday morning, we get up super early because Guthrie is where I live and Norman is where my church is and that's 45 minutes. And so we drive early to get to church because I have to go out and pick up donuts for Dan. Dan is a 90 year old man who sings in my choir. He's been a brilliant man through his mm. career and um, starting to fail a little bit. And so anything I can do for Dan, I will. So pick up donuts, get the church open, Clay opens the door, my husband and uh, opens the doors and gets things going. And then you start prepping for you know, the, the morning. So um, all of you have, you know what that's like. So we, I'm out of there probably by about noon because our service get over before that and then I go home and um, collapse no um, so I have found that for my, for me worship planning starts uh, happening for me for the next week or two or however much I can get from my pastor um, Sunday afternoon late and into the evening that's just a good time for me to be able to focus I think maybe because of the other thing that I do if I'm not showing my house or something but that seems to work pretty well. And then Tuesday is my day to go work at my church all day. We have a staff meeting in the morning and we review the, the worship service from the previous Sunday, kind of talk through that. We preview the upcoming, go, it's pretty much in place. We kind of tweak it. Um, and we, you know, of course, do other things that we do in the staff meeting. And then the rest of the day, I'm working. I'm doing things that you all have mentioned and, um, and then I go home, unless I have a meeting on a Tuesday night, and then I come back on Wednesday afternoon and evening for uh, work and then for rehearsals and so forth. 
Um, over the past seven years that I've been at North Haven, my responsibilities have varied, but currently, besides leading, you know, music and worship on Sunday morning, I, you know, and planning, um, I do some of those things that you talked about delegating, and I'm just sitting there thinking, I probably kind of could do that, you know, delegate some of those responsibilities. I also have a new pastor. Mm -hmm. He's been in our church eight, eight months, and this is his first senior pastor. So, but, but I'm telling you, I'm telling you, he is, he is such a great young man to work with. He's so supportive of all of us, and I feel like he's very supportive of me, and seeks to, he's authentic. There is no pretense with him, and he's willing to learn, trying to assess where we are. The church, we've kind of been through a bumpy road when you lose a pastor, um, and, and the pastor that I served with previously had been there since the church's inception. So the church is 15 years old. Um, so it's just been really interesting. <laughs> so, um, so he's doing a, a good job of assessing and helping, I think, to figure out what we need to do to move forward. He's just beginning to do some long-term planning, for which I'm most grateful, because mm -hmm. my previous pastor would do what some of you have mentioned, and that he would long-term plan, mm -hmm. which was great. Um, I think my pastor will get there, so um, I, I'm looking forward to that. So again, when I looked at my patterns, I looked at certain things that I was doing each week, and I tried to do what you, one of you said, leave yourself notes and make notes and lists, and. Um, of things I need to do. For for instance, just this one popped into my brain. I need to send the bulletin draft for the next week's worship to my sound engineer, you know? And I, so that, because then he coordinates all of everything else, the, you know, the pro, present, pro presentation, the, you know, the invites. Yeah, and, and so that's like really important. And then the people who accompany, you know, the worship, I need to send them stuff out. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I sometimes I feel like I'm more ahead of the game than others, and then I get behind and I get a little frustrated. So all of what you said, I concur, and some of it I've gone, oh, I need to do that. Now I'm going to talk about something that, that I have learned about. Okay, for me, one of the hardest things for me to do is set boundaries mm. and abide by them. And it's really hard for me to say N-O. And yet, mm. there are times when I need to say no. Um, an example in the Bible is when the young man comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to be saved? And, and Jesus says, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love others as yourself. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means you that after you love God first, You've got to love and take care of yourself because if you can't do that, then it's going to be really hard to help others. And so part of taking care of yourself, I have learned, is setting boundaries. A few years back, Dr. Rhonda Bradley told me about a book titled Boundaries. <laughs> and it's by um, Henry Cloud and John Town Townsend. And I got the book the, back then, started it, and then set it aside. Two years ago, a counselor reminded me of the book, so I read a little more, <laughs> set it aside. My new pastor has our staff reading books and discussing, so guess what the second book he gave us? Oh my gosh, no <laughs> way. Yep, boundaries. <laughs> I finally read the whole book. Didn't have to play it. Oh gosh. Um, and it's one of those books that everybody <laughs> should read. Everybody. I mean, I, we just, it's a they really go into detail, and that's why it's kind of hard, because it seems like, well, you already said that. But yeah, that's why you read it in chunks, I think. But let me just read you the back cover, because I think it's I so, um, maybe I was just convicted and thought, this is so right. And I have, each of us have things in our own life that we don't have good boundaries in. And I, I'm speaking from my own heart. Um, so here's what it says. People often focus so much on being loving and giving that they forget their own limits. Have you ever found yourself wondering, can I say no and still be a loving person? How do I answer someone who wants my time, love, energy, or money? How do I stand up to hurtful behavior or abuse? Why do I feel guilty when I consider setting boundaries? 
in this award-winning New York Times bestselling book, Dr. Henry Cloud and John Townsend give you biblically based answers to these and other tough questions. They show, they show you how to set healthy boundaries with your parents, spouse, children, friends, coworkers, social media, and even with yourself. This updated and expanded edition specifically shows you how to set boundaries in our increasingly digital world. Unpacking the 10 laws of boundaries, Drs. Cloud and Townsend show you how to bring new happiness and health to your relationships. You'll discover firsthand how sound boundaries give you the freedom to walk as a loving, giving, fulfilled individual God created you to be. Um, you are welcome to look at this book. I bought it down here in Waco because I forgot my copy at home. So if you need it, it's yours. Um, it, it really has been uh, an important book for me. I have a, an 89-year-old mother that I work real estate with. She was one of the reasons I um, retired from teaching to go do that. Learning when you're working with your mom and she's your boss, <laughs> boundaries are hard. They're real hard. Um, and I've seen it in other family members <coughs> too. Um, so it, and then it, you can just keep going with the people that you work with in your churches or, or where, wherever. It, it just has some helpful things. Uh, I'm going to share my tips that I um, wrote down. And again, they kind of verse what people have already said. Have a work plan, times when you plan to do various things. And then uh, this helps me keep on task. Um, utilize spreadsheets or templates and save them. Um, anything from rehearsals to um, you know worship planning and, and, and especially seasonal times of year. Even if you're like me and you have a new pastor and he's maybe not gonna do it the same way the former pastor, it's, it's at least something to go from. Um, establish routine, C number one. Um, use your technology, your phone, your calendar notes, reminders, or even a real planner, like, you know, they used to make. <laughs> um, then I put number four, boundaries, read the book. Um, carve out time for yourself. Take care of yourself spiritually, emotionally, physically, relationally. Search for daily moments. Oh man, I'm just preaching to myself, okay? Mm -hmm. Not only just daily moments, but time away. And this is the hardest for me. It's so hard to be gone. It was hard to be gone to come here. Um, and then I just keep reiterating, set boundaries for yourself, read the book. Um, and then the last thing is find someone who is a true friend, a confidant, someone that will give you honest feedback, keep you accountable, and love and pray for you. And I, I am realizing, I think it's because I'm old, um, how important that is. I've had, I've had people like that all through my life, but I think I finally realized the importance of it. And it doesn't necessarily have to be your spouse. It can be, and, and my husband is a great sounding board for me, and he gives me great feedback. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I need someone that's not quite as close to me, and this was brought to my attention by another lady in my church. Um, she gave me some wonderful comments and advice because I was recently ordained in May and um, just I was very honored um, and overwhelmed and she said to me in a note don't forget that you need to always have someone who loves and cares for you and will give you honest feedback and I thought that's just right so that's what I have what, what say you some of you speak we have time. I love lists. Um, <laughs> I keep yellow pads, white pads, all over <laughs> everything. I mean, you know, here's the list. Cross things off, add to it, and then I take it back to my computer. I find one of the things that helps me uh, at the big times of year, like cantata, Christmas cantata, I will have. And I, I, I file, I keep from year to year. So this year, I'll start with my list from last year because so many of the tasks you're gonna do, they're gonna be the same thing. Mm -hmm. right? But I'll lay out two pages. Here's two weeks prior to Cantata. Here's one week prior to Cantata. And I'll put all, every day of the week on there. 
and then as I think of things I need to do, I'll plug them into specific days. So I don't just have a list of stuff that I need to do. Okay, I know on this day I'm going to move the chairs from the choir loft to the chancel area. On this day I'm going to get all the mics set up. And that way it's not, the, the, the tasks aren't so overwhelming, and I've got them prioritized, and it, it, that works well for me. It, for big things like that to do, I guess, I think of this targeted list or prioritized lists. Yeah, and Stephen, you referenced that too. Yeah. I'm a people person, and I love, that's why probably most of us are in this I role. Um, I love people. Um, and so um, we are office on our third floor, um, and everyone is there. So it's a tasker, you know, a, a, a head tasker, and then the, the rest of the seven of us, the ministerial team, are all sort of window office. It's much like a good old corporate. And then we have the cubicle space in the center with all of our support staff. Um, and our new family minister has a new team of six that are in this, you know, like old shirelings, as they call them over there at the Shire. So we've just got a bunch of new resident D kind of young. Uh, employees of the church and it's just a party up there sometimes it's just really hard to, <laughs> to uh, and what used to be um, at South Bain the our office my office was a, a choir room a whole other building a whole other you know quiet space but um, I know that I need that in order to be efficient it's funny uh, we talk about introverting and extroverting sometimes I feel like I have to be a professional introvert and so when I'm a professional introvert and I accomplish the tasks I feel so good. You feel so good. You know, just like an introvert has to be a professional extrovert. I know a lot of pastors who are very studious and pull up in my office, and they got to go do the whatever reception. And oh, it's just it's a. But when they leave that reception, they feel like I know it seems crazy, but it's true. There's a lot of pastors that really they don't like people. <laughs> um, um, and, and so, all that is to say, I, I've learned and I've. This is a great session because it's just reminding me of things I've told myself I wanted to be better at. And, um, <laughs> but that, that is, I work out in the morning early, really, really early. And so instead of, I know we've had to navigate some kids to school drama and, and Houston traffic and construction. But um, that if I can get in there early and, and, and beat the rush and beat the crowd um, to get a lot of things done. One of the things I want to do this year, I, I, I put this on your hearts. Um, because someone laid it on me years ago, it literally just came to me uh, today, um, is take my choir roster, uh, my sanctuary list, um, as well as maybe my youth and, uh, and middle school, or we call them tribe, but the, the other young, young choirs. And literally every morning, I'm just going to go right to my, our printing person, get a stock, a card stock. We have a nice little thing with the etching of our church on it. And, and literally just pray over that roster, um, however I see fit, be it by birth dates or by alphabetical, but one person a day, maybe one adult, one youth, or whatever the case may be, is depending on the size of your choir, is just write a, write a note. Mm -hmm. um, don't know why I thought about you today, but you're on my heart, and I mean, it doesn't have to be anything like something catastrophic going on in their life. I just know that when I do something like that, I feel like I've accomplished something huge today. Um, and it's handwritten, um, not a text. Um, while that is equally meaningful, and it can be, there's something about a youth uh, getting a card or a note in their box, their slot at the choir room, or maybe it's in the mail. Um, but those handwritten notes are something that I'm going to uh, lean into. Um, my choir president also, I seek that individual to be my accountability person. You know, I think sometimes I don't lean into those offices as well as I should. Um, and, and utilizing those individuals the way we should. Um, so I think this next year, talk about your accountability, I'm gonna, I'm gonna work on uh, having some intimate, just, hey, I'm, be transparent. You know, did this rehearsal, how did we do today, tonight? You know, um, to really work on being better uh, and, and willing to receive that, that, that constructive criticism a little better. And, and um, um, so, uh, and, and I think all this is to say it, it helps with the home as well. I mean, um, I, we do Google Docs for worship planning, so which means that I can access the worship service anytime. Right. We 
which is a lovely thing, and it isn't a lovely thing. When my wife wants to watch the romantic comedy, and it's our time to watch the movie, and I'm plugging in, you know, the title for the anthem Sunday, and what was that composer's name? And you know, and she's like, "I'm over here," you know, or whatever the case may be. So um, that this leans in back into your boundaries conversation, yeah. um, and I, I just um, the technology is helpful. It really, really is. Uh, we can be at a retreat like this, and I can plan worship effectively. Um, and um, I need to know, you know, know when to, to turn it off and, and uh, be better stewards of that. I would say probably um, in our case too, we, and it relates to the boundaries um, issue. You know, some of our folks, and, and I'm, I'm like Carrie, you know, I, I love people. I'm energized by people, so I, I love it. But it, it becomes very time consuming too, but I'm okay with that. But I know I need to manage my time better. But one of the things that probably drains me the most are the folks uh, in churches their whole life. And I mean, and it's, and it's, it's like every, their entire world, it's almost like they don't have a family. <laughs> it's just like right there. And so it's just constant, and it's a constant pull and pull and pull. And, you know, and, and whenever something, they're having a, a, a health, even a minor health thing, it becomes this major deal. And if you don't respond, it's almost like you're sending them a message that I don't care. And I really do care. But some things uh, just drain you. And so I'm particularly interested in, in, uh, in seeing. They address that. Yeah. It, it's, because it's I different. love people, but at mm -hmm. some point, you know, you have to be productive. And um, so, yeah. I think one of the curses of the technology is its instantaneous nature. I mean, you, it, for those who remember the days of letter writing, you know, think about it. You, you'd write somebody a letter, you'd put it in the mail, they'd get it after a while and then they'd sit down and write you one or you might pick up you know long distance phone calls you didn't make a lot those were expensive now somebody sends you a text and if you haven't answered it in 10 seconds or as soon as you receive it they weren't are you there why, why aren't you answering mm -hmm. and so it's how you can break yourself out of that need to reply instantly mm -hmm. but how do you handle the person on the other end of it who is sitting there going why aren't you answering me Right, right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we have, I have a couple of dear ladies. Oh my goodness, love them to death, but they have they love pets too, and so they <laughs> love to post things about their pets. And if you don't respond, it's like, you know, why did you like my picture? Yeah, did you see what I posted on Facebook? Also, yeah, I mean, or, or when the pet is having a little, you know, illness or something like that, and it's. We have a, a rule at the church on staff that once you receive, they supply all the ministers with these home devices, which is a, a nice little perk benefit. But with that comes an understanding that we reply within a 24 hour time period of any email that comes through. And so when I received uh, an email once from a supervisor of mine, who shall remain nameless, uh, <laughs> you can eye roll. <laughs> I love that. Uh, but uh, anyway, he, uh, uh, I, I received this email, I did not reply, and then I was summoned to the office for a little conversation about said email. Why did I not reply to that on Saturday? I said, well, it was an unimportant email that I did read, but it was not important. And I was told, you need to make sure you're replying to emails that the membership, the laity sends. Oh, absolutely, that's hands down. I don't care about that. But when my higher up sends me an email that really can wait till Monday, that I'm going to draw that line. And I drew that hard line. I said it's not going to happen. Um, so, but we can do that. And you're still there. Yeah, well, I've been there for 15 years. So. Yeah, they need, they need <laughs> yeah, to read this book. <laughs> <They need laughs> <to read them. laughs> just because an email can be sent doesn't mean it necessarily needs to be. So I think yeah, we as see. ministers need to respect the other people on staff, knowing that if that's the expectation, let's not ding people with emails that uh, really can wait until Monday. We, we, we spend a, a chunk of our staff retreats 
once or twice a year whenever we have them. Yeah. And we, we spend a, a good 30, 45 minutes re-upping or reconfiguring our expectations mm -hmm. on communication. I think that's something everybody should yeah. do. So mm -hmm. when, when I text you or I, you know, if my pastor calls me, um, doesn't leave a, a voicemail, I can't get to it. I'm with my kids or whatever's happening on a Saturday, yeah. I'm coaching Little League, whatever, yeah. um, and he doesn't leave a message, I don't call him back. Because I know he's probably just had a thought or something. We just have some understanding. Yeah. Same thing with door policies and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, and I, I envy our, my administrator, who you know well, Brad Jernberg. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Brad is a guy that comes in early and leaves at 3 30, 4 o'clock because he's got little ones, like little, little ones. Yeah. And uh, he's done. Like he, he puts in his time. Now, he's an administrator, so it's not quite as that pastoral presence that's needed there, but. On a Saturday, he, he just won't answer. He'll say, I'll, I'll get back to you. Now he's, and, and we all know that's sort of his, his thing. Um, two more things that are really quick. One is Glenn Atkins, who's my mentor, uh, another minister of music I, I treasure. He would take Thursdays off. Mm -hmm. So um, he got the office to approve. This. So he would have his Wednesday night rehearsal, the big, the big show on Wednesday, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but Thursday was his day off. That was his time to go home, do the yard, whatever, uh, and just, just have whatever he needs to do on Thursday. And then he would come in Friday when many of the other staff were, were off. Um, so it actually, I thought that was an interesting twist. If, if you're in a situation where you're, uh, you have that flexibility and that, that, that luxury to maybe select that, find maybe there's a day in the week that might work better or a routine that might be a little better for, for you. And the second thing is another one that's I'm holding myself accountable to. Uh, we just did a big work this spring. I was just uh, talking with Cross about that. We did the Mozart Requiem. Um, it was wonderful. Um, it just took me back to my days in school. And just what it, what scored. I, I get a little spoiled with either my musicianship or my ability that the, the, the sacred octavos, the anthems, I don't spend as much time um, praying and score studying those anthems as I should. Either we know them or they're new or they're really accessible or, as I said, I don't give challenging music to the choir because I do, but um, I just don't spend as much time in score study as I should. I don't give that. And my professor from college, I remember him saying, the person in the hospital can wait. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa no, they can't. Like, I mean, he said, they can wait. Your priority as a music minister you have a priority in making sure that music is prepared, that you are prepared, going back to what you were saying. And I always like, I always wrestle with that. Like, oh my gosh, that just doesn't feel right to me. But, but you know, I think going to what we're saying, if there is a, a set time of score study uh, where we can really devote to that, maybe it's that early morning hour. Um, I really think that that really goes a long way in preparedness. Um, I had to with the Mozart, clearly. I had right, to. Right. Um, and, and uh, and then, you know, another colleague led us recently and, and I, in rehearsals. Um, instead of a big prayer at the end of rehearsal, we really prayed before every anthem. Um, and it wasn't this long, you know, poetic whatever. It was just a simple prayer, a message in that anthem that he wanted to convey to the choir. Um, and what it showed me was he wasn't just going through their anthems that night. There was some spiritual intentional um, gems that he was wanting to pull. Not just are we getting the A flat, but are we are we really getting the message of this text and what this is going to mean for us seven weeks from now? Right. You know, um, and, and anyway. One thing I have to do, uh, so I serve a large church in Dallas, a worship Baptist, and it's an entirely organ driven service. Mm -hmm. So that's my responsibility uh, as an organist. And, uh, so I have to make sure that obviously I have time on the bench not to make that happen. It's a very high bar. A lot of it was self-imposed, unfortunately and fortunately. So there, there was expectation, but I went over that because that's just my personality and my passion. Uh, and so I used to just go in when it be 100 something degrees outside. And Turn the fan on. When there was no air conditioning in there and the pipes were hot. It was winter, 20 degrees outside, and the pipes were out too, and I'm shivering. But I started doing research and found out the benefits of actually playing uh, or practicing in an environment where the pipes were actually in tune. You don't have to tune the organ as much. 
So I save about $2,500 a year in order to make these videos by playing when, with a steady Sunday morning temperature. So I have about uh, two sections of four hours each that are planned on our church's calendar where if something comes up, I have to say, I'm sorry, I had a rehearsal. Oh. And this is kind of a heads up for time with certain folks uh, in leadership where it's like, I'm very sorry, but I can't just meet with you for 10 minutes. That's 10 minutes out of my job. time to make Sunday yeah. morning happen. That's right. And um, where, you know, I can always go, I guess, 10 minutes over, but if it's in the middle of the pizza, but that, that's, a, that's been so useful to have that where I absolutely cannot get away from it. Something that could help, I think, in the choral setting um, is to have a place that you can schedule on your church's calendar to go to your school, school study so you're not in the audience. If it's the choral hall or the sanctuary, to make sure maybe you have a little piece of your feet in there. That way it's it's a little bit more pressing to know this is my time in this space. Obviously for me it's obvious. It's like, well, she's busy working at <laughs> I've got to kind of go do that. Uh, but it's been such a big help for the last few years. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty much reasonable to block out time. I mean, pastors will very often yeah. say, you know, this yeah, is my time and the schedule yeah. that I'm going to be doing sermon prep for whatever it is. Now. That's a reasonable yeah. allowance. I know a church in Fort Worth that uh, they plan out the entire year, all the sermon titles, titles. Wow. I mean, stick to it. Uh, they, obviously, it's a lectionary church, it's Presbyterian, mm -hmm. St. Stephen's. We call it Fort God because it's got a great But the, the anthems are published in a slick cover deal that goes out to the congregation. This And it's issued, you know, first Sunday of Advent, beginning of the church year, here's what we're doing. For the entire year, even the, the anthems. Everything. All that's the nice. Just the name, the title, the favorite. Huh? That's, just the titles of all the Just the titles of the new ones. I always look with envy at, at those churches. That uh -huh. So I, I've been pushing this at my church, and we've got, we, we're a lectionary control at Wilshire, thank goodness, and <laughs> which is very helpful, but I actually have been pushing, finally got it last year to do the entire academic year. So summer, because I, I, it doesn't involve the youth choir. When I took up the youth choir, I thought, oh wow, I really need some help to make sure we're uh, climbing ahead. And so the first year we did just the fall in its entirety and then the spring. And then the next year I just kept pushing and pushing. And we actually did the entire year. Yeah. Wonderful. And so we'll do that again this year. And it's, now we can't function without it. So if you can get to something like that. Yes. I think my pastor really knows what the lectionary is. Yeah, I've managed to get him on a, and I, I know his sermons maybe a couple of weeks in advance because I also do the graphic design to yeah. mm -hmm. present the sermon you know, in, on website and stuff. So he has to have it to me at the beginning of the week for that. Mm -hmm. So. Take adding that little responsibility helped in getting him to actually plan sure. his sermon before Thursday. Yeah. But the flip side of that, the one nice thing about it, he's like, you know what? You do what you think is best for music. You know, if the music matches the sermon, okay. If not, I'm not fussed by that. Well, that's something we try not to do a dramatic service. That's our goal is to not do that. Because hmm. we're going to always fail at some, some level. Uh, I'll try and find one thing that maybe I can tie in. Yes. So our hymns are always playing uh, up until um, this spring, this past spring. They were always chosen just the Monday choir, which meant my time on the bench was even more important. Mm -hmm. A lot of what I do is actually composition and improvisation, so that has to be you know really planned out. Um, but now we do two weeks out, which is a lot better. Yeah. Uh, for that so I have a question uh, for, of you all. Um, how many of you do uh, your church planning by the church liturgical year. I mean, am I saying it right? Yeah. So most, many of us do, yeah. Because because I, I grew up with not that, okay? Me too. And, Me too. and then uh, yeah. I really learned a lot when I was at the Presbyterian <laughs> Church in Guthrie. Mm -hmm. And then I really started to learn more. And I mean, yes, we studied in college, you know, you do sort of in the, the mass and all that, but not really. You know, um, 
So that's where I started learning about that. And then when I went to North Haven, um, we, it's not that we, my former pastor didn't always preach from the liturgy, but we still followed the liturgical year. Now, I'm sure you know my pastor, because yeah. he, he came from Wilshire, Jacob Popper. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. He's, yeah, he's my new pastor. I love him. I love him dearly. And he, for the most part, is following, following the liturgy. Um, <clears throat> you know. yeah. So that's why that's we keep saying that. <laughs> yes, I, I, you could be my kid, but I love Yes. Anybody else have anything to offer? Thank you guys for coming so we can have a session. <laughs> and thank you to our panelists. I appreciate it. Thanks for your input. We learned some things too. Yeah.